Welcome everyone. My name is Amy Goldberg. I'm the CPQ practice lead here for Canidium. Been here for about five years. We're going to be doing an awesome podcast today with the good friends Michael Gross and Franco Fievet from SAP. We're going to be talking about CPQ and commerce and when you want to use CPQ versus commerce and what the features are to help everyone, customers and potential sales reps and pre-sales engineers learn the difference of when to bring it up into an opportunity and when to ignore it. So, Michael, you want to give us some background on yourself and your new wetsuit? Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Amy. Um, my name is Michael Gross. I'm a senior solution engineer for SAP CX. I've been working with SAP CX since, um, what, about 2000 and, uh, let's see, six years, so 2014. Um, I came over with the Hybris transaction, uh, so I did have uh, that kind of commerce background coming in. Uh, prior to joining SAP, I was also uh, running a uh, commerce startup, uh, running on a different platform, but I have a lot of experience uh, with e-commerce, um, pretty much from development all the way through to front end. Awesome. And where do you live that you're going to be using your wetsuit? Oh, yes. Yeah. I live in Los Angeles, California, in Redondo Beach. Uh, I have a daughter and a son and a couple dogs. And uh, yeah, as I said, I just got a wetsuit so we could start to take advantage of our uh, self-imposed quarantine here in California. And uh, at least I can get out of the house and do some sort of exercising without having to go to a gym or anything like that. So it should be yeah, good in the awesome. ocean. You know, just have to worry about the sharks. That's about all. But I'm just, uh, we don't have we don't have a ton of them out. That's good. Do your dogs come with you to the ocean? No, they they're not allowed down by the beach here. We do walks above the ocean, but they're okay. not allowed on the beach, unfortunately. All right. Awesome. Happy surfing. Frank, yeah. hi. Yeah, should be fun. Hey, Amy, how are you doing? It's good to talk to you again. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. So uh, just before we get started, kind of want to say hey to both uh, Dawkins and Lee and make sure that Lee knows it's in that order. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. And for those of you who don't know, Dawkins is my dog and Lee is my husband. So to kind of introduce myself, my name is uh, Franklin Thievet. I'm based out of Birmingham, Alabama. Graduated from Auburn University with a degree in industrial design. <laughs> kind of taken a long and winding path to land in pre-sales about eight years ago, really started out with a focus in process management. And in the last two and a half years, I've been working at Calidish slash SAP with really, uh, my focus has turned to CPQ. Uh, speaking for hobbies, I have three small boys at home, so I'm really kind of immersed in a world of uh, dude perfect videos, video games, turning off lights that they leave on and trying to kind of explain to them why they can't go out in public with their clothes on inside out and backwards. So that's kind of it right now. And if I can uh, ever get that across to them, maybe I'll pick up my guitars again. That'd be like a lifelong lesson trying to tell them how to dress, why to dress that way. Yes. My wife's kind of still doing it with me. So I guess it never ends. Right. Lee does that with me too. When we go out in public, <laughs> he's like, I think you should wear this up and all right, fine. I guess I'm wearing that. Now, what is one thing from each of you that your coworkers don't know about you? Hmm. It's a good question. They, uh, I mean, a lot of us, well, have been working together for six years, so there's not a lot that they don't really know. With all our customer visits and uh, internal meetings, um, yeah, there's not a, too much that they don't know. I, I, I can't. I'll go over to you, Franklin. Maybe I'll think of something, but I'm trying. I mean, they know <laughs> there's a lot. You know, you spend a lot of time together. You end up talking about yeah. a lot of things. So. Sure. Yep. Yeah. My coworkers might be surprised to find out that ever since I was about 16 years old, I've worked in picture frame shops. And so I know a lot about framing and I helped a friend out who owns his own shop. So whenever I go anywhere, I'm quick to critique how pictures are framed so I can tell if it's done right or not and so forth. So it's a little one of my little OCD habits. And I can verify yeah. that too, frankly, because the first time we did a video call, you looked at the picture behind me and asked me questions about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of look around my office right now and the picture behind me is uh, a little wavy and it's starting to annoy me. I might have to go get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think of anything for you, Michael, or you just want to move to the next uh, question? Yeah, move to the next question. I mean, I, I can't really think of anything. I don't have anything that randomly obscure as picture framing in my background. <laughs> I wish I did. 
it'd be very, very helpful because, uh, as Franklin said, there's always a, a picture or two that needs to be framed here and there. All right. So let's dive in then. We're going to start with Michael. You've given us an overview of commerce, what it is, when it's used, all that good information. Yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of background on SAP Commerce Cloud. Um, as I said, it originated as Hybris, uh, which was a company based in Germany that started in the late 90s. And about uh, five, six years ago, SAP purchased Hybris and brought it into their customer experience uh, arena, um, along with a bunch of other products, which is also Calidus as well. Um, we currently have about 2,500 customers running uh, SAP Commerce Cloud, uh, covering uh, over 20 industries in more than 100 countries around the world. And I thought a pretty interesting statistic about SAP Commerce Cloud is that uh, yearly sales through the platform top 500 billion gross merchandise volume. So there's a lot of volume uh, running through our platform currently right now um, around the around the globe, really. Um, and I think to understand commerce, you really have to define it first, um, because, you know, when you tell people commerce and you, you work in e-commerce and SAP Commerce Cloud is for e-commerce, a lot of people don't really understand what that means. Um, they, they do it every day. And really what it is, is it's a platform that guides a customer experience through an interconnected process of searching. I right? want to search for products, evaluating, reading information about those products, and then purchasing products or services across digital channels. And um, we're really one of the only vendors that provides a single solution on the same platform for both B2B, business to business, B2C, business to consumer, and B2B to C, like you might find with some multi-level marketing companies out there. Um, we're very, very highly ranked, usually number one ranked in both Forrester and Gardner. So the analysts do like the product as well. Um, and just a couple side notes about the product. Um, because there's so many other you know, software that a lot of um, our customers are running, um, it should be noted that Commerce Cloud can be run standalone. So um, if you that's all you have, you know, you don't have a lot of other systems that you need to integrate with, that's fine. You can run it standalone. Uh, typically, our customers are integrating us with um, enterprise resource planning, which is their finance uh, and back office uh, kind of ERP solutions, typically called ERP. Um, SAP has really cut its teeth over the years on our ERP solution. Um, and it can, of course, be integrated out of the box with SAP, but it can also be integrated with any other ERP solution uh, that our customers might have. And we find it's about a 50-50 split. So 50% are running SAP ERP, and 50% of our customers are running just about any other ERP system out there, and we're integrating to it. Um, it some of the other typical um, uh, software that we're integrated with would also be uh, content management system software. This is the software used to manage the content that people will see on their websites and on their e-commerce shops. Um, while we do include our own uh, CMS software, which we call Smart Edit, a lot of our customers will use a third-party uh, CMS tool to um, control the content and manage the content on their front ends for their uh, for their customers, really to increase that customer experience, right? Great images, great videos, great experience on the website. Um, so, yeah, that's a quick overview of uh, Commerce Cloud. Thanks, Michael. And do you find that there's any specific industry that uses commerce more than others at all? Um, obviously, retail is very, very big. Um, uh, but but of course, we have a lot of customers. I would say over 50% of our customers are B2B. Uh, so a lot of manufacturing are running commerce. Um, I suppose uh, travel, automotive, these are kind of some of the big industries where we're seeing a lot more movement in um, these days. But really, I mean, there's there, I, I haven't found an industry yet that's not using e-commerce and there's a lot of industries out there that are really making that shift um, now to a more commerce and digital central send digital uh, uh, digital kind of experience for their customers awesome thank you franklin i saw you were drinking some red bull there are you ready for the cpq overview i am i am so I, I think the, the first place to start with CPQ is kind of an explanation of what does the acronym even stand for, and it's configure price quote. And for a long, long time, it's been a, a capital C for that uh, configuration of your products. But when 
anyone asks me what what does CPQ do, I kind of have a standard elevator pitch that it's the definition of the quam, complex quoting process, allowing your sales reps to focus on the relationship with the customer. A little dry there, but it, it really focuses on five high level steps when we start talking about the quoting process. First, how do you arrange your products? How do your end users find them? Second, how do you configure those products? You're going to go into pricing of the products after that. How do you kind of fit them to the budget appetite of your client? You're going to generate documents for the fourth step, and then you're going to feed the downstream systems with your placing of the order. Now, for a little bit of history of the solution itself, it was created in 1999 in a company called Webcom. Webcom was acquired in 2011 by Calidus Cloud, and recently in the last few years, Calidus Cloud was acquired by SAP, of course. Now, in the early days, CPQ kind of really stood alone, just like Michael was talking about with commerce. And you would come in, you would handle all of your quote process, and then you would feed your downstream financial solutions, you would feed your ERP, et cetera. But after that, we really saw the traditional definition of CPQ grow. And this is where CPQ would sit in between your CRM, whether that's C4C, Dynamics, or Salesforce, and your ERP, which is typically ECC, S4 HANA. Um, it, doesn't really matter. We're agnostic of both endpoints, so you can use whichever systems you would like. Now, when you come in there, really what CPQ is doing is defining a lot of those things, uh, such as product selection and configuration, your cross sells and your upsells, pricing and discounting, uh, renewals and document generation, for example. And whenever we go into clients today, I continuously see this. They're really looking for the definition of those items because the clients really don't understand what exactly their sales reps are doing. They're having uh, leakage around their margins. They don't have transparency into the process. The sales reps are kind of doing their own things inside of systems they can't track. And so CPQ is pulling all that together and really giving them the definition they need. There's a quote out there that I really love that says, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. If you can't control it, you can't improve it. And that's really what these companies are looking to do. Define it, control it, measure it, and so they continuously improve it. Now, this was the traditional view, but if you go out there and you start talking to the analysts such as Gartner or you start looking at what we're experiencing uh, it through our everyday lives, you're going to see that the number one growth opportunity for CPQ right now isn't necessarily CRM anymore. It's actually with commerce, whereas CPQ started out as a B2B tool for primarily the manufacturing industry. Now it's covering every industry and these businesses really want to take the middleman out of it and control the customer experience so they're moving to more of a b2c model where the users can come in through commerce and self-service to get to the products that they need great thanks Martin. and you mentioned utilizing cpq with commerce more often so how often are you guys seeing customers utilize both systems in the same digital transformation project you know, when two and a half years ago when I started, this would maybe come up maybe 25% of the time. And now every opportunity that we have come in front of us, every single client is speaking to this. Everyone's curious about what can we do with CPQ and commerce together. Yeah, and I think a lot of the reason for that is really to create a low-touch environment, right? Remove that layer from build to quote. So instead of waiting for a call or having someone submit a form and then having another person then type that form or, or those form responses into a configure price quote tool, you're kind of taking that away and you're giving the customer the power to actually configure price and quote their own products. Um, really the idea behind this is to create kind of a B2C experience in the B2B world, right? We're all used to shopping on, on uh, eBay and Amazon and Walmart. Why not give that experience to the B2B customer or the customer who needs to configure a complex product or a complex solution? Um, so this is why we're seeing this a lot more, right? Give them this easy to navigate UI, make it a self-service application, you know, take that, um, take all that work that we're currently doing, answering phones, submitting forms, and allow the customer to do that on their own, 
forms already submitted. Of course, we're already, you know, from a commerce perspective, we can really move that solution or product right into a cart. We're connected to payment gateways. And we can also give the, um, the advantage of adding things like vouchers or coupons as well. Right. So customers are saying, great, I can configure, you know, this product, but um, as a company, I might want to give them some more incentive to purchase that product or service. So with our commerce system connected to CPQ, as I said, we can add things like vouchers and coupons, payment gateway, those types. of Yeah. And when you follow that up, what you're really talking about with CPQ on the back end, really enabling the commerce experiences, take advantage of the customer specific pricing, take advantage of the complex configuration rules, which I believe we're going to touch on in a little bit, but you don't want to have to duplicate any work and actually having to recreate the rules. Leverage CPQ, what it does really, really well, and do it in a seamless manner so the customer doesn't even know it's happening. The next question then we have is, when would customers utilize CPQ without commerce? Sure, sure. I'll tackle this one for you. So I want to give a little bit of acknowledgement to a gentleman named Michael Raja on LinkedIn. He wrote an excellent article a few months ago that really pertains exactly to this subject. And as a side note, I found out later that Michael used to work at Webcom, so he's a, it was a kind of a nice little feature with that. Well, in his article, he, he really kind of speaks about a number of things, but the things I want to focus on are really start with the complex products. So when you think about commerce, they handle variants very well. But when you get into more complex products, things that have attributes or variables that can lead you to have thousands of different combinations, millions, even billions of different product combinations, that's really where CPQ comes into play because you can – lay those products out and you can also configure the rules on the back end that make sure that all the up and downstream needs are met so you can make sure that when you configure this product and it's fed to your erp system there's not going to be any misconfigurations that are going to lead to issues there so again making sure that your upstream is done correctly so that your downstream doesn't mess up uh, second is going to be around complex pricing when we talk about cpq the c has always been capitalized it's always been about really complex product configuration. But what we've really found in the last few years is that, that P is really growing up, the pricing component of it. And this goes around things such as pricing optimization, discounting for customers, uh, customer-specific pricing, and everything that surrounds that also. These are things that CPQ handles very well. Now, building off of the pricing component, there is the concept of workflow inside of CPQ. And when, generally, when you think about workflows inside of CPQ, you're really thinking about approvals. And this pertains to my sales rep comes in, they're going to discount a product, but they're going to surpass their threshold or guardrails, and they're going to need a manager or supervisor to approve that before they can price or pass the price along to the end customer. That's just one example of workflows inside of CPQ. Another example would be an engineered to order process, for example. So if a client comes along and they want a product that has never been created before, you can use the workflow engine inside of CPQ to send that to engineering, get everything spec'd out with the appropriate cost, and then flow it through the other additional departments so that the final price can come together. And then you can package all of that up and send it to the end customer. And then finally, once you get through the, the workflows, the approvals, the engineered to order, you can also start talking about the generation of documents. This is where we can put everything together, give them the pricing, the marketing, the associated marketing materials. And you can also uh, associate with a contract lifecycle management system. So you can go back and forth on contracting where your depart your legal department and the client's legal department can have redlining back and forth. And then, again, give all of that back to the end customer at the very end of the process. Thanks, Franklin. Michael, anything you think you want to add to that? No, no, I think that was a that that was a great explanation. Exactly. You know, and we also talk about. I mean, I, I guess the only thing I would really add to that is, um, from a commerce perspective, obviously we're we're putting into the hands of the customer the ability to configure price and quote. Um, when you just run CPQ on its own, we do find a lot of customers find this very valuable as well uh, because their internal salespeople uh, are configure price and quote in front of the customer, right? So we're not putting it in front of the customer, but we're still enabling the, the salesman or the account executive or the account manager to configure price and quote, sometimes even in front of the customer you know, face to face with the customer or over the phone with the customer. Um, but we don't need to push that out 
you know, per se to the end customer to do the configurations. Um, we still find that a lot of customers are using both, you know, once they've configured on their own system, of course, they can pass this over to the commerce to actually, uh, you know, through the payment gateway and maybe attach some promotions. Um, but we don't necessarily have to put it with commerce, embedded in commerce. It can act alone. And then, of course, conjunctively, you know, as Frank was talking about, as it's as it's working through the back end, pushing it over to ERP can also push an order into commerce so that we do have that order within the commerce system. Yeah, that's, and that's a great point, Michael. All the customers that we have for CPQ, Canadian, all want to see the mobile application because a lot of them do do the configuration right there in front of the customer on iPads. So they want to make sure that that functionality is working really well. So great exactly. point. Exactly. So let's talk about the roadmap. What does the roadmap look like for commerce coming up for us? Well, our main focus moving forward is to deliver a cloud-native software-as-a-service commerce solution. Software as a service is also known as a SaaS solution as well. And we're really trying to offer quick time to value for our customers. Customers want to get up and going uh, much quicker than they did before. They have to act fast. They have to move quickly to be competitive in the marketplace. Um, so what does that mean really? Well, a, a couple things. We, we want to design and a, an appealing and intelligent UI for our customers to work with. It has to look good. It has to feel good. Our customers have to enjoy working within our environment, right? We also want to design uh, an API first technology. And what does this mean? It really allows us, if we can develop an open API first technology, it really enables us to embed our commerce everywhere and integrate with existing environments like CRM, customer relation management, ERP, back office, logistics, inventory, and, and a lot more that really enables a consistent and enjoyable end-to-end -end customer journey. Um, commerce isn't just on your computer anymore. It's not just mobile anymore. It's really everywhere. And we need to make sure through that open, open API first technology that we're delivering on that promise. Um, I did mention cloud native as well. And why do we want to be a cloud native, uh, cloud native e-commerce platform? Because we want to start to leverage technologies like headless commerce and microservices. And if we can do that, this will deliver a lot of agility and innovation, which a lot of our enterprise customers are requiring in order to keep their competitive advantage. And of course, they don't want to lose or compromise any flexibility, right? So that's really what we're trying to focus on is that cloud native uh, approach uh, in our roadmap. And lastly, it's AI-based personalization, which is really the ability to self-optimize your store and deliver in the moment contextually relevant experiences. So what does this mean? It's it's kind of tailoring a session as someone logs onto your site or your mobile device um, to deliver the right content at the right time for your customers. Whether that content is promotions or search results or search options, we're basing this all on real contextual clicks that a customer is going through on the site. And if we can do that, and we can do that with a with a store that can kind of self-optimize through AI. Uh, we can deliver really relevant experiences to our customers. And of course, if we can do that, we can really increase our ROI and our bottom line. Michael, that AI piece kind of sounds like when you're on Amazon shopping and you scroll down to the bottom, it says users who bought this might also like this other thing if they also bought that other thing. Is that kind of what you're talking about? That's certainly one aspect of it is the suggestions and they you might also like, but it's also recognizing that if a customer goes to your site and, and they're clicking on certain categories of products or certain products that are um, maybe in a, you know, certain products that, that, that are really specific to that search among a whole group of products. So imagine you go on Amazon, Amazon has millions of products, but let's say you're just looking for pet supplies and you're starting to click on those categories for pets or uh, um, you're looking for food or beds or something like this, the AI can then eliminate pretty much everything else on the screen and just start to show you images that are relevant to that, to your, to your pets or to the products uh, that, that you would maybe buy for your pets or specific promotions to just your pets, as opposed to just in the past, you're already setting your promotions, 10% off this, 20% off this, 30% off this. You're showing all the categories. This way we can, in the moment, recognize where that customer is leading, where that customer really wants to go, take them there, but then show them those specific products that are relevant to that uh, search, um, as well as, as I said, promotions, vouchers, coupons, shipping specials, anything else like that. That's awesome. Very cool. 
Franklin, how about the roadmap for CPQ? The roadmap for CPQ, obviously, we've been taking a lot of compliance courses around this, so I'll claim Safe Harbor right here. Don't take anything I say for gospel and don't quote me on anything, but if you want to speak to someone about our roadmap, I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with some of our product managers. Now, if you ask me about where the roadmap is going, I can tell you that it's all about strengthening those native integrations with the existing SAP portfolio. And there's really three main focuses that they have right now. The first is going to be on ERP, and this is specifically around the VC integration. And when I say VC, I mean variant configurator. SAP has an existing configurator that's been living in the manufacturing side of the house for a long, long time, 10, 15, 20 years. And a lot of our clients have a ton of investment put into variant configurator. What we're doing is we're not wanting to duplicate the rules in VC inside of CPQ and have all of that rework. Instead, we're actually replicating all of those rules so that you can actually utilize them in CPQ. Whereas VC is a very manufacturing and engineering friendly tool, it's not necessarily a sales friendly tool. So we're going to replicate those rules, allow your sales end users to use those rules and avoid the duplication of all that that work that would be needed for to reconfigure the rules. The second one is going to be commerce, and Michael alluded this to this earlier. There's two places in commerce where that integration is really going to focus. First is in the request for quote process. This is where an end user can come through commerce, request some products, and then maybe want to see if they can have some discounting applied to this, see what the sales rep can do to do for them. They request that quote. It's fed into CPQ. The sales rep can handle cross sales, upsells, discounting, et cetera, and then feed that back along with all the associated documentation to the end user inside of commerce. The second part of commerce is what we call headless uh, CPQ. And this is where when your rules are configured inside of CPQ, you can actually leverage those rules through the commerce UI, again, eliminating that ability to have to reconfigure everything for commerce. So you can take advantage of those really complex products, customer-specific pricing, et cetera, inside of commerce itself. Third part would be with billing, both our BRIM and subscription billing products. These are for things such as your subscription billing, your renewals, uh, co-terms, your uplifts, etc. How do you handle those once they come through CPQ, you configure the products and you feed them on? W closely integrated with both of those products. And then finally, there is a lot of improvement going into the underlining quote engine within CPQ itself. This is where we're talking about the continuous improvement of the solution itself. We want to make it as efficient as possible because when you start talking about some of the industries that we deal with, specifically things like telecommunications, these quotes can be hundreds of thousands of line items long, and we have to accommodate for that. And not only do you have to accommodate that for that, you also have to be very mindful of the time it takes to generate a quote like that. So when we start talking about hundreds of thousands of line items, we want to be able to get that up in seconds, not minutes. And with the quote engine currently in CPQ, we can do that. And with those continuous improvements, we're even making it quicker. That's awesome. And those continuous improvements are also going to add more features that the old document engine or the old shopping cart had. Is that correct? Yeah, we're adding new features, and we're also improving what what we have in the system today. So when you look around and you say, well, this worked for us five, six years ago, but now we've evolved. We've looked at it, and we've said our customers really want something else. So we've listened to them, and then we're going to put those improvements into the underlying engine. So that's a lot easier to administer from the back end. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do these extra bonus questions. Bonus question number one. For Michael, what is your favorite feature or soon-to-be feature of commerce? Well, um, I have a couple. I really like headless. I really like where we're going there because uh, it really enables the customer to really use any front end that they want. Um, and we've always been headless, but now we're we're really accelerating that. And uh, by offering the customer kind of a templated version of, of a headless of a headless site, so that they can they can get to market a lot quicker. Um, but really, my favorite thing is what we call context driven services, and this is really our phase one of uh, our AI kind of roadmap. And what this is is it's real time segmentation capabilities. So what you can do is you can, as a customer, 
is moving through your website, whether it's B2B or B2C, you can create certain segments that the customer might fall in, right? Amount of items in the card or certain categories in the card or spending time on this page or that page, right? And from that information, you can segment that customer immediately. And then you can deliver meaningful, personalized customer experiences for that particular customer when they're on your site, right? So we can leverage relevant banners or images or relevant product search results, promotions that are specific to that segment. And if you, we find if you do that with customers, then what you're really gonna do is end up driving higher conversion rates, right? More purchases, happier customers. Customer feels like you really understand them and understand what they're looking for. And um, as I said, all this is happening in real time. So these could be anonymous customers. So forget about, you know, we already know who you are. We already know what you've bought. That we can do, and most people can do that already. But it's really understanding, like, in the moment, personalization as the customer's moving through your website. Very cool. So, Franklin, bonus question number two is the same question to you about CPQ. Yeah. When I think about the future of CPQ, I get excited about two areas. Um, really, it all comes down to leveraging the entire SAP portfolio. Every single day, I learn about something new. And it's interesting to think about how that can be implemented into the uh, the quote process. When the first thing I think about is leveraging SAC, which is the SAP Analytics Cloud. As you come through the quote process and you think about product configuration and the cart, how can you utilize analytics to take that even further? When you think about the cart, how can I use that for pricing, showing you know scatter plots of highs and lows, and really getting the best margin that I possibly can, based on not a guess, not on what I think it should be, but what on the market will bear and what analytics will tell me. And then also, can I trend out into the future and see where we're going to go with that so maybe I can get even more? When I start thinking about personal favorites, I really have to start thinking about visualization. As we think about everything that we do on our phone and looking at a looking at a product on our phone in 3D and rotating it around and clicking on it to actually configure it directly and actually seeing how that configuration is going to affect the aesthetic, that's really powerful to me. So when I think about that and I think about the tools such as SAP Visual Enterprise, I get very excited because I see a path going down the augmented reality and the virtual reality route also. That's a great point, frankly, because a lot of customers nowadays that we're working with are wanting the visualization piece. And I've also seen, Michael, you, I think, Steve, you showed us a demo with some visualization in it as well. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. You saw demos where we uh, took advantage of 3D visualization with, you know, being able to, as you're configuring the product, you know, the the parts are actually changing what you're visually seeing and then able to kind of spin it around in 3D. Um, uh, that's something we've been able to do in Hybris Commerce and SAP Commerce Cloud for quite some time. Um, but now the addition of CPQ um, with all those rules about, you know, what you can and can't put into that particular product really enhances that those capabilities. Yeah. Yeah, this is another example of what Michael's talking about, making the B2B world even more like the B2C world. This is the expected norm, and this is what you have to do in CPQ. Yep. Awesome. Well, great. And thank you very much for your time, Jim. Was there anything else that you wanted to add that maybe you thought of last minute, like, oh, I should have mentioned this great thing about commerce or CPQ? Anything else coming up for you? If when I think about CPQ, I, I would encourage everyone who has an interest in the field to really reach out and listen to the CPQ po uh, podcast by Frank Zahn. It's it's wonderful. There's a lot of great information there. I mean, I guess one of the relevant things that I'm thinking of when it comes to SAP Commerce is, is what we're kind of experiencing now with, with the coronavirus outbreak and a lot of people being, um, you know, self-isolated. Um, is really forcing the hand uh, to make e-commerce uh, much more relevant in our society. I mean, we're looking at uh, some first movers out there that are enabling customers like me, who's not going to leave my house for a month or two, to order things online like groceries or supplies or things like this, where we're finding in a lot of stores shortages of certain items, you know, toilet paper, paper goods, uh, meats, things like this. Uh, some of these movers out there who have really embraced e-commerce over the last year or two um, are much better prepared to handle this type of a situation uh, than other customers are. And I think, uh, you know, because of that, some of these 
companies in, are going to survive this crisis much better than others. The uh, organizations or, or companies that don't have that setup are really going to be struggling right now because, um, you know, people aren't able to go out and make those purchases, right? So e-commerce is becoming more and more important, and this is kind of one of the reasons why, right? Yeah, I physically really cannot go out. You know, my, my parents are old. They're in their late seventies, early eighties. You know, I, we don't want them leaving the house because they're very susceptible. Yeah. So how are they going to get groceries? How are they going to get food? How are they going to do these things? They're going to have to, they're going to have to start ordering online. And if we can make that experience easy for an 80 year old person, then, mm -hmm. you know, who's not used to doing things online and, and shopping and things like this. And, you know, if you can create that, that, experience that's easy to use and for people like that then um you know you're going to really put yourself in a good position to survive situations like this where otherwise you know it's going to be a tough tough road for the next couple months so and going forward probably i would think that if people who don't normally shop online for as many things as we're going to have to now once this is all over and people can go back out to the stores and go back out to restaurants they'll still probably be ordering online more than they had had the coronavirus not quarantined everybody. Yeah, no, big time, big time. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you'll see a lot of people too will adjust their expectations, whereas some of this stuff's going to be a little bit too easy. And when they go back out in the real world and they hit these brick and mortar stores, they're going to be like, well, why am I getting treated like crap here when I can just do this, you know, one click and Amazon's going to have it to me in a day. I mean, yeah. I've been talking about yeah. that, but it's just going to reinforce it so much more yeah yeah i agree right. i mean and and that's just from a consumer perspective even b2b perspective as well right you know i can't go out and visit my customers anymore i can't sit down with my customers face to face anymore and go through some of their needs um you know i can't visit them and walk through their warehouse and make sure what they need and what they don't need you know i'm relying on them to do that now if i can, I can give them the tools to do that very easily through a you know a b2b solution where they don't need me anymore really i mean it's i'm a nice to have and i definitely added value but at times like this i, I can't be there customers can still order what they need to to you know to to do business right yeah great point awesome well thank you very much gentlemen